Okay, today's lecture is on the medieval in the 19th century and the use of the medieval in the 19th century. And we have a guest star today, and that's Zoe, who's right over here. Um, it was a very nice kitty. Anyway, um, so let's get right into this. We are going to downsize and bam. Okay, so um, to start off with, previously, we have been talking about the development of a Middle Age between the fall of Rome and the Protestant Reformation, right? Um, and this kind of development of a Middle Age has seen the year approximately 1500 as a point of radical temporal departure or break um, from which point there has only been progress since, right? And this is in contrast to previous kind of ideas of time which looked back to a golden age from which they had fallen. The later Middle Ages in this time is seen as a primitive and barbaric time, right, defined by a feudal system and slavery and contrasted with modernity and liberty. And this, we have already seen, has had severe implications for the construction of race in Europe. That is, time has become racialized. There is a denial of coevalness between colonial and colonizer, uh, colonized and colonizer, and that the colonized space um, in the rest of the world, the non-European world, was cast as pre-modern. Right? But we've also seen that where there was an increasing kind of uh, interest in the studying of medieval documents. Um, this guy, uh, Jean Mabillon, we encountered last time, right? Sources for the creation of tools for source analysis, paleography, um, codicology, uh, and philology. Um, the first collections of projects and for medieval manuscripts occurred in this kind of 17th, 18th century time. And we talked about that. Um, and this is generally called, this kind of 17th, 18th century period of kind of collecting and stuff like that, is generally referred to as antiquarianism. That is the interest in old things. And there's one more shift, because there's one more shift in the kind of 18th century that we haven't yet talked about. And that's a shift from amateur to professional, right? Um, today, amateur means you're bad at it. Right, um, an amateur is unskilled, undedicated. They just do something else most of the time, and this is just kind of something they do on the side. But originally, amateur, amateur is amator. It's a, it's someone who loves to do something. Right, it's not a negative term as it first comes to be, and so you have gentlemen amateurs um, of philology or gentlemen amateurs of the study of history. Um, in the early 18th century. By the end of the 18th century, however, there is a transition to a culture of expertise, right? The idea that a scientist or a professor is a profession, right? And that history is, only so is something that only professionals can do. Um, and this kind of maps onto what has been generally referred to as the Enlightenment, which is to say the 18th century kind of explosion of ideas um, kind of fomented by the printing press and things like that. And the Enlightenment as a term is one which deliberately contrasts itself to the Dark Age, which it succeeds, which is, again, the origin of this sort of a thing, this idea that there's a past that they are trying to move away from. Um, and in this kind of period, you know, this is, this is a period, by this, by this point in time, um, France, the UK, um, the United Kingdom, um, Spain to much of the same degree, not yet Germany or Italy are kind of all in their present shape. Right, so this is kind of an uh, an intra explosion of um, learning that follows national boundaries, nationalist boundaries. In fact, um, it's also a period that saw, as I have already said, modern race thinking, the development of modern race thinking, that is thinking along racialized lines, particularly as a way to differentiate colonizer and colonized. Um, and for example. <clears throat> 
one of the most kind of striking examples of this kind of use of race to dehumanize colonial subjects is with um, American aboriginals, um, American natives, who originally, kind of in 1500, are kind of viewed as sources of information and techniques that the settlers, the colonizers, need to learn. They're, they're, they're a source of knowledge and information. Of course, that adoption can only go in one way, native from the native to the colonizer. The colonizer, um, the native learns nothing, according to the colonizer, from the colonizer. Um, and eventually, kind of this process sees the idea that non-whites, uh, the Native Americans, are actually maladapted to the colonial environment, that uh, by the 19th century, white settlers start to think that they are better suited to the Americas than the native populations are um, because they're not dying of smallpox, more or less. Um, and it's important to, th to know kind of this race thinking, right? This, this kind of process of thinking in racialized groups did not simply uh, kind of define us from them, right? Did not define whiteness from blackness, um, or did not design, define European from colonized uh, individual, but rather, or it, it did those things, of course, but it also unified the us in the European sense into a cohesive culture. For example, France in the 18th century was heterogeneous. Uh, linguistically and politically, um, north versus south. There are two kind of, there are so many, many general regions with subcultures in France. The biggest division is something called uh, Languedoc and Languedoc. Languedoc literally means the place where they say oc, um, versus Languedoc, which is the places where they say oi, which is oui, no, in French, yes. So the two words for French, uh, oui, which comes from uh, ille, the Latin ille, and uh, the Occitan, the Southern French, um, oc, which comes from hoc. Um, this is all because Latin has no word for yes. So they kind of took two different words that means that thing um, or this thing. Um, so in any case, North and South of France, linguistically diverse in this period. Um, and one of the ways the French monarchy and then later Napoleon united France, these kind of disparate parts of France, into a country was to kind of put... France against the Mediterranean, against the, Med uh, against the pe other peoples of the Mediterranean Sea in distinctly racialized terms. Now, slavery has been a feature of, and kind of captivity and piracy has been a feature of uh, Medit the Mediterranean, um, the Mediterranean basis for as long as there has been a recorded record. Um, in kind of the uh, following the conquest of Constantinople in uh, 1453, this dynamic took on a distinct um, religious overtones. That is to say, there were Muslim um, pirates and, cap and cor uh, corsairs, and there were Christian pirates and corsairs, and they tended to capture um, Muslims and Christians, etc. And you know, Christians would ransom themselves back to. Uh, Europe and Muslims would try to ransom themselves, kind of pay for themselves to be sent back to um, to North Africa and to the Middle East and to uh, kind of Turkey, Anatolia. Um, and it's important to kind of think that this is not chattel slavery, right? These are not people as property. These are people as kind of things that you can hold on to until someone wants to buy them back. But, right? But as the French... As, as the French kind of central governments, either monarchical, monarchical or kind of Napoleon and kind of later governments, try to cohere the various parts of France, they do so by placing themselves as protectors against these pirates, these Muslim pirates, in a very similar way that kind of the discourse in the, the 2010s talked about terrorism and being protected from terrorism as being American is to be opposed to terrorism. And of course, this um, 
the, these kind of divisions, this kind of the language in which this was talked about, was along racialized lines, not simply religious lines, as you can kind of see in the pictures behind you, right? Um, that is to say, the dark-skinned um, or strangely dressed uh, Muslims are capturing very, very light-skinned, often dressed in white, as in kind of in the central picture, um, French Christian women, as their men, and kind of again in the central picture, uh, kind of look on without being able to do anything. Now, this is incredibly important because most, almost all of the captives taken in the Mediterranean were men, but almost all of the captives depicted in uh, kind of imagery of this period are white women, right? And so there's this equation of racial, there's this kind of fear of racial mixing, um, the equation of kind of men being unable to protect their um, their women from animals is kind of all kind of shoved into this language at the same time. So this is kind of a development of what we now see as race, right? And so this race thinking develops in lockstep with colonialism, as we talked about last week, and nationalism, as we see here. And all this feeds into and influences the direction and the use of the study of a, quote, medieval past, right? And so remember when we were talking about last week, about our last lecture, about tools developed in the 17th century for examining the legitimacy of monastic documents, right? There was, again, paleography and kind of um, uh, uh, philology, right? Um, the majority of these kind of, from the kind of the 15th century to, to, to about the late 18th century, these were most, these tools were mostly used either on kind of very specific monastic documents that the monks wanted to prove or on biblical criticism. Um, there is a great search at this point in time for the original, uncorrupted biblical text. If you've ever heard something like the search for the historical Jesus, um, that's something that comes from this period, particularly kind of on a German side of thing. And the search for beginnings in general was incredibly important to, um, the, right, the search for beginnings of both religious identity and state identity were very important generally to this period. Again, history, history in a colonial world is a property, right? And having a claim to origins, historical origins, gives rights to territory. And these origins, kind of politically, are usually uh, what have been called barbarian tribes. Now, I've mentioned these kind of in the very first lecture very briefly, right? That is, after the Roman Western Roman Empire quote-unquote fell, um, you had a whole number of uh, so-called Germanic tribes come and invade, uh, one of which was the Franks, of whom you see uh, Clovis, who is the first uh, Christianized king of the Franks, nominally Christian, not very Christian, behind you in a 19th century painting. Right? He, there, this is not a uh, 6th century painting of Clovis, obviously. Um, and so all the modern states had to have one of these tribes to kind of point themselves back to. The French obviously had the Franks, um, but they could be less than, um, they could be less than kind of direct and linear. For example, when the, uh, when Belgium was created as a buffer state, they kind of just dug into Caesar and came up with a tribe that was called the Belgae, which was maybe originally there. Um, and kind of just, oh yeah, so Belgian, obviously been there since the beginning. Um, and of course, sometimes this is the opposite. Um, sometimes again, medieval both as privileged past and kind of place where you, you know, source of all the things that are bad. Um, the French revolutionaries, that is to say the ones that were trying to cut off the heads of their kings, tried to draw a dichotomy between uh, peasant Gauls, that is to say Roman citizens of what is now France, and the noble Franks, this guy Clovis, who came in on 
and kind of conquered them, right? And the French Revolution was trying to throw off the Franks and restore Gaulish nobility in much the same way that you will see in Ivanhoe this discussion of Saxons versus Normans. And we'll get to more of that later. But this, this kind of still concedes the idea of kind of tribes as these kind of wandering tribes as origin points. And just to put it kind of straightforwardly, the idea of coherent tribes in kind of the 6th and 7th century post-Roman period, 6th and 7th century post-Roman period, is false. The Romans, as a general principle, and most of almost all of our sources are in Latin for these sorts of things, tended to take a specific name that they heard and generalize it. For example, um, very few quote-unquote Germans um, would have called themselves Germani. Germani is one small tribe that existed for probably a pretty short period of time on a very specific point of the Rhine. Um, but, like, they were the first ones the Romans encountered, and so they just kind of were like, oh, you're Germani too, right? Um, in, in, in kind of the ways, one of the, kind of very similar to the ways in which, you know, the distinctions between South American nations blur for some Americans. Um, and, you know, there's, for, for some Americans, like, all South American nations become Mexico. Um, and we see this with things like German. We see also see this with things like Slavic or Slav, which seems to have been a very small tribe at one point um, on the Danube and uh, was generalized into a people. Um, and this has profound implications, particularly for um, kind of German relationships between the modern German state and kind of Eastern Europe, where they see Slav coming from as the kind of the origin of the word slave and therefore the people that the Germans should justifiably dominate. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Hitler and uh, was so brutal um, to the Western kind of the Eastern Front. Um, if you think the Holocaust was bad, the behavior on the kind of the death camps in the Auschwitz was bad, the German behavior in kind of uh, conquering the, the, air, the lands to the east of them was even worse because they kind of believed that they had this kind of ethnic righteousness, this 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 tribal righteousness over these people. And how not not only was these ideas of tribes false, and kind of the Romans kind of generalizing from these very specific names, um, kind of in a very very uh, dismissive fashion. Um, how an individual would identify themselves depended on what they were trying to do. A single individual could, when fighting for Rome, be called a Roman general. But if, for, if Rome didn't give him exactly what he wanted, he could rebel and become a barbarian invader. And so the, you had these, uh, the leaders of these tribes code switched, for lack of a better term, between kind of a barbarian and a Roman identity. And kind of the final problem of this kind of uh, idea of tribes is that there is a language, there's an equation which occurs in the 19th century, a false equivalence between culture and language. And the idea that a continuity of linguistic patterns in a region implies or uh, guarantees a continuity of culture. That is, using the terms of philology, which again is basically linguistics at this point in time, you could say that people spoke something that was related to modern German in a certain area around Europe for a set for the past, you know, since the, the fall of Rome. And therefore, these areas were Germanic, right? And therefore, the people in them were Germanic, and therefore, the culture was Germanic. And this is, of course, doesn't follow. Um, Celtic works much in the same way in uh, kind of different contexts. Anytime you find a, um, oh, sorry. So, and this is actually a reinforcing, it's kind of a problem with the kind of the use of archeology span and history as kind of um, compatible disciplines, which is to say that, you know, historians say, oh yes, well, this was Germanic. And then we can prove that because, look, there are Germanic items that the archaeologists are digging up, and the German the archaeologists are digging up items and going, oh, they're Germanic because the historians say that the Germanic peoples were here, right? And so anytime you find something with uh, kind of a, a what is now called a Celtic knot on it, or a torque, or uh, which is kind of a neck, um, neck piece of neck jewelry on it, all of a sudden that's immediately Celtic, right? That grave is Celtic. Never mind that they could have bought it 
um, from a guy, right? It says nothing that I have this particular brooch or this particular decoration on me um, when I'm buried, except for the fact that I had that brooch at some point. It doesn't say anything about the culture I'm in. Um, so there's this weird kind of self-reinforcement that we don't really think about very much. Um, and those kind of countries... Um, so as, as kind of various nations were trying to build themselves up and do this, um, those with like kind of less clear or less obscure, less um, kind of well-known histories, well, less, histories less well attested in the Latin tradition, um, went out and fi found them. Uh, not usually as atrocious as kind of the Belgian example I just gave, um, but England uh, is a particularly good example of this, mostly because... England was a cultural and political backwater until the early modern period, until it became a colonial power, right? Um, and so Alfred, the petty king of Wessex, mostly forgotten, or sorry, the petty king of, um, yeah, Wessex, um, mostly forgotten, uh, except for kind of obscure historians, uh, becomes uh, Alfred the Great, who fought against the Vikings and the origins of all the king, and the origin point of all the kings of England, right? Um, and the readings for this week, Ivanhoe specifically, shows the British emphasis in the 19th century on what is called the Norman Conquest, um, one of our best sources for which is the Bio Tapestry, which you see behind me. Uh, you may have seen this in other classes as well. Um, in the Norman Conquest occurred in 1066 as a dispute over the English crown between Duke William of Normandy, which is uh, kind of the peninsula that juts out to the side of France, um, who invades and defeat, defeats the Saxon, uh, supposedly Saxon, Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings. And it's interesting to note, I don't know what to do with it, um, but having just watched uh, Bridgerton, it's very, very interesting that they make the Black Duke, who's the center of the story, the Duke of Hastings. Right, this key moment in British history. I just have to think about what, to, what that means and what that's really doing. Um... At this point, at this after the Battle of Hastings, where Harold Godwinson is killed and William of Normandy becomes William I of England, um, existing English landholders, existing, um, as, as uh, Walter Scott calls them, um, Saxon landholders, are dispossessed. And the lands are usually given to the Normans. And so, as with France, where you had this kind of Franks over Gauls, you have here Normans over Saxons. Um, and so, we have this is actually kind of evident linguistically still, where um, for a lot of kind of high end foods, that is to say, meat, right? Meat is very valuable when you actually need the cow for milk and don't want to kill it, right? Um, the word for the animal comes from English. And the word for the uh, food stuff that comes from the, 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 the meat itself is romance, is French. And so we say cou for cow, right? The old English is cou. And the, if we want something on our table, we say boeuf, right? Beef, the, from the French. Or uh, pig, English, and pork, French, pork. Um, we say uh, sheep and mouton right? For what we're eating. Um, and from this point, right? From this invasion, right? Again, we have a French, essentially Norman. Um, Norman is technically, right? Technically Vikings, right? Norman, North man. Um, but at this point, you have what is nominally kind of a continental power, let's call it that, um, kind of ruling over England, but most of their power, most of the, the, the Norman kings, um, the Angevin kings is the term for the, because um, they come from Anjou um, of, of England. That is to say everyone from, um, oh, what is it? Uh, I'm going to blank on this. But it's from William to um, uh, uh, the end of the Plantagenets in, in the 15th century. Um, really kind of Henry II, Richard Lionheart, people you've heard of, John... Prince John, uh, King John of Robin Hood fame, um, they most of their holdings and most of their shore holdings and most of their most productive holdings are on the continent, right? Even now, England is kind of second. Yes, they're the kings of England, but it's the secondary aspect of their domain. 
Um, and it's important to note that, like, in the popular imagination, this kind of dichotomy between um, between uh, Normans and Saxons is very long lasting, right? The events of Ivanhoe um, take place 150 years after the conquest. So who did the Normans conquer? I've already called them Saxons, um, but let's put a pin in that for a second. Um, there were various kingdoms of England, kind of circa 800, um, old English kingdoms, and as you see this is, I have kind of crossed out old uh, Anglo-Saxon because we're gonna talk about why that term is a problem and really call them old English kingdoms um, of Mercia, East Anglia, Essex, Kent, um, Wessex, Northumbria. Um, but these kind of, to call these, these, these kingdoms Saxon or English, Angle, right? Um, is kind of false because, as you can see from the picture on the left, um, half of this area, well, a third of this area is Wales, um, and a third of this area, a half of this area is under something called the Dana Law, which is to say it's ruled by Vikings, um, by Northmen, by people who speak uh, Norse languages and are conquer have conquered and suppressed and still raid the Angles and the Saxons. And that's how medieval texts talk about the people who lived in Mercia and Wessex and East Anglia and Essex and Kent. They talk about them as the Angles and the Saxons, as two distinct linguistic and ethnic groups. The hybrid term Anglo-Saxon occurs only ten times, uh, it's six times in Latin and three times in uh, Old English. Um, and I would note that in Walter Scott, he, again, only uses the word Saxon. He never says, right, Anglo-Saxon. And this is in part an attempt to contrast a kind of Germanic and slash English versus Romans and French, even though that's not true, right, because the Normans are Northmen. Um, so why do we think about these kingdoms? Why is this map, for example, labeled Anglo-Saxon? Well... It comes from philology. Um, again, philology had similar interest to modern linguistics, which is to say figuring out where language comes from and how it is used. But the theory aspect of philology quickly became all important. And the theory aspect revolved mostly around this kind of racialized equivalence of ethnic group and linguistic group as, pre as precursing the modern nation. <laughs> And so Anglo-Saxon comes into being as a term which attempts to make English pure um, as a little bit of an inferiority complex versus kind of French, um, which is kind of the predominant language of learning for almost all of human history, or for all of um, European uh, post-Roman history. Um, and kind of as attempt, in this attempt, in this kind of attempt to purify English, Anglo and Saxons, uh, calling it Anglo-Saxon, also kind of excludes things like Welsh, which is a key to the development of English as a language, um, and things like Brythonic, which is the language that was spoken in uh, the British Isles before um, Anglisk and Saxones kind of showed up. And Anglo-Saxon thus almost became immediately a term which really meant white, um, which stood, which is kind of has been replaced a little bit by um, by uh, Caucasian these days, but still is in common use. And so you have this uh, special human representative, Republican representative Mike Kelly, who says things says like, "I'm an Anglo-Saxon, right? With a name like Mike Kelly, you can't be from a place other than any other place besides Ireland." Now. Whereas Ireland is not on this map of Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, Anglo-Saxon, even for the philologists, wasn't Ireland. Ireland was a backwater. Irish people were be being persecuted horribly by the English, kind of at the period where this is happening. This statement is has only serves to show that Anglo-Saxon now is quite simply a racialized term. Right, Celtic works very similarly to this. We'll get into that when we talk about the kind of First World War and where that really comes into power. Um, 
And they did this. They made this thing called, Ang which they called Anglo-Saxon. Oh yeah, yeah. This is this was my reaction to reading Mr. Kelly's uh, little statement there. Uh, it's an old meme, but it checks out. Um, there is a very little um, surviving Old English as a text. For example, Beowulf, which we'll read next week, which is the greatest poem in Old English literature, exists in one really badly damaged manuscript. Um, it almost didn't survive. There's not a large amount of Old English floating around out there, right? Um, but its importance and prominence, right? Every Almost every English department has a scholar of Old English in an American university. The importance and prominence of Old English is important, is due to British political importance in the 19th and 20th centuries. And we'll go, go into more of that in a little bit. Um, German history takes a similar course, kind of deeply cloaked in uh, professional scholarship. I couldn't find a good English language map of pre-German, pre-Germany, Germany. That is to say, this here, the the, the Confederated German states. Um, so that's why the, you see behind you, it is in German for all one of you who speaks it. Um, in any case, the Germans, the people who lived in this area you see here, um, use the use like to use the tools of philology and textual criticism. Um, these, you know, pre-German German scholars, kind of reduced complex pre-modern categories like the tribes we, excuse me, talked about to their modern equivalents. That is to say, their the equivalents that were contemporary with them as they were alive. Um, is it another slide? No. Okay. Um, so kind of at the first half of the 19th century, um, these scholars tended to research what they called common German kind of, uh, common German roots, right? Um, that is to say the roots in these post Roman tribes, linguistic roots, the medieval history of German peoples. And this was actually kind of in contrast to the French and the English, which where it was kind of this construction of nationalism, this was an act of civil disobedience. Because as you can see, Germany didn't exist, right? German Germany was not unified into a single country until 1871. And this, so the local princes, you know, the, the prince of Prussia, um, the prince of Holstein, the prince of uh, the king, the emperor of Austria, uh, the king of Bi uh, uh, Bavaria, for example, um, didn't like the idea that there was a common German identity to which they had to bow, right? Um, and so the, the local princes who did not want a unified Germany, who wanted to preserve their own political power, did not like these academics talking about a common German identity. Um, with the actually the exception is Prussia there. Prussia had for a long time had kind of imperial ambitions and they would actually ultimately succeed there. Um, and so in Prussia we see the development of things like the uh, the in the kind of this same period, the early uh, 19th century, the things like the Monumenta Germania Historica, which is Latin for the, the monument of German history, the kind of mass, which is one of these, the first of these great collecting endeavors to be kind of divorced from religious um, origins. This great collecting of quote unquote Germanic manuscripts by which they meant everything they could put their hands on and possibly claim as belonging to them. Um, but kind of because these early kind of 19th century German um, scholars had this political agenda and because this political agenda was defeated in 1848, which was when the kind of a first attempt to unify Germany failed, right? Um, as kind of in as part of the backlash to that failure to unify Germany in 1848, um, these academics started to deliberately avoid politics to kind of depoliticize and kind of retreat into their very detailed studies of things that no one cared about. And if that sounds like the modern academy, that's not without reason, because this kind of moment had a great impact on the development of American history. 
of the study of history in America and in the English-speaking world in general, and in uh, France and Spain and Europe as well. Um, this because mostly because of a guy named uh, Leopold von Ranke, um, who died in 1886. Um, he's a German. He's usually called the founder of modern history. Um, he was a deeply conservative man, and like most kind of academics of his generation and most kind of Germans of his generation, he was deeply obsessed with the idea of a German Volk. Uh, Volk is a Volk is a very difficult word to translate into English. Um, you've encountered it before because you've had a Volkswagen, right, a people's car. Um, which work <laughs> yeah, the Nazis came up with the idea for those. Um, but as because Volk was a very Volk was a very important word um, for kind of Germanic racialization. Um, and so he was seeking so Ranke, among other things, sought out kind of origins of the German people, the Volk, the Volk. Um, and he has a particular influence on kind of the American universities because American historians liked to go to Germany for training. Um, none of them actually trained with Ranke, but they trained with the students that Ranke trained. Um, and here we have a problem because the Americans were bad at German. Because um, Ranke's kind of, the thing he liked to say about history is, history is, wie es eigentlich gewesen, my German is terrible, wie es eigentlich gewesen. I can I am so bad at German. Gefesen. Um which if you butcher it, uh if you don't butcher it like I just did, translates according to the Americans as quote as it really was. Right? Stu history, history should be represented as it really was. And so this kind of is a call to do kind of literal text based no politics hide from the world history except for eigentlich uh, that kind of word in the middle there that i had such trouble saying a second ago doesn't really mean really right it means kind of as it essentially was that is ranka was trying to say capture the spirit of the age in which you're trying to study this is a much more quote big r romantic idea of history than kind of the the German the Americans who are bad at German like myself um, kind of brought back to America. Um, and these this all kind of came to kind of kind of piled up on itself um, as when Germany unified in 1871 um, and G Germany as a state now tried to catch up with the other colonial powers to try to build an empire for itself. Um, you know pretty late in the game, as it were, um, but kind of also to build a national identity. And they worked with these tools that they had, philology and uh, text criticism, to lay claim to, quote, British and French medieval sources and kind of this general um, expansion of uh, German identity. And this is deliberate, um, a deliberate equation of national and uh, academic concerns, which defines not only the history being done at this period, but kind of how we still think about the Middle Ages. For example, there is a very famous battle, um, the Battle of Tours, or the Battle of Poitiers. Um, they're the same battle. Tours and Poitiers are not actually very close to each other. It occurred in one of those two places, and it occurred in either 732 or 733. So as you can already tell, we've got some problems here. Uh, traditionally, it has been called the high watermark for Arab conquest um, on the northern side of the Mediterranean in Europe. That is, the Arab forces had, as you can already see in the map behind me, um, in 11, 7, uh, 711 uh, to 720 or so, conquered the pretty much the entirety of the uh, Iberian Peninsula from the Visigoths, that is to say the Germanic tribe that was there after the Romans. Um, or, well, what the Romans called, remember those little caveats that I said before. Um, 
And they were theoretically, according to some, poised. They had already swept across all of North Africa, across the Iberian Peninsula, and seemed um, to to modern historians, or for in almost every textbook you find, um, as you can see, kind of depicted in this map here, um, poised to conquer all of Christian Europe until the second Moorish wave was defeated at Tours, as you see in the, again, the kind of legend of the map behind you, by Charles Martel. Uh, Charles Martel is Charles the Hammer. Martel is a, a metteau. Um, and he's the father of Charlemagne, which is the guy who founds the Holy Roman Empire, right? Um, and this kind of legacy, the legacy of the Battle of Tours has been called like a world historical event, um, event of great importance. Um, there's still um, the, the French, the kind of French nationalist anti-Arab movement calls itself the Charles Martel Group in memory of this Battle of Tours. And you can see uh, kind of on the right there here, there's a kind of very um, it's a 19th century depiction of the battle of, of you know, a Frankish mounted cavalryman, uh, they would have been on foot, defeating uh, a Saracen infantryman who would have been on horse. Um, or are they both on horses? Oh, they're both on horses. Um, because it's knights versus knights. But in any case, it should have been Arab cavalry versus uh, Frankish infantry, but that's fine. Um, the only problem with this kind of event is that it didn't happen. It's in every middle uh, military textbook on about the Middle Ages you will find out there that this happened. That you see a map very similar to the one behind me. Um, which shows kind of this conquest of the Iberian Peninsula and then this massive attempt to invade Francia, the Frankish kingdoms, which is turned back after a six-day battle at Tours. Um, in French literature, it's turned back after a six-day battle at Poitiers. Uh, it, 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 it didn't happen. Um, we, we have very few sources. There, there was an invasion. There was some sort of a battle in approximately 720 to 730. Um, we have a letter, we have a couple sources. The first of these sources, a letter, is a letter from Duke Eudo um, of Aquitaine to the Pope in Rome, claiming that in 12, uh, 721, so that is to say uh, 11 or 12 years before the supposed date of this battle, that he defeated uh, uh, 375,000 Arabs um, and only lost uh, 1,500 men. Um, this number is dubious in the extreme, considering the population of Rome and Constantinople, the two biggest cities in the Mediterranean, put together would have been 100,000 people. Um, so this is probably just simply not true. Um, there are also two kind of contemporary chroniclers that say, actually, Eudo of Aquitaine, that duke, invited the Arabs as soldiers to fight with him versus Charles Martel. There's a small note in the annals of a monastery called Lorsch that Charles Martel had fought Arabs at Poitiers in 732, not Tours, at Poitiers. Um, and then kind of 50 or 100 years after, 50 years after the fact, um, a guy named Einhard, who's kind of the official biographer of Charlemagne, puts up the battle a little bit, um, puts up kind of the fight, a fight at uh, Tours or Poitiers as... Um, you know, as a little bit of propaganda, but doesn't really overemphasize it. It's not kind of a big battle compared to all the other battles Einhard describes. Um, in Iberia, one Christian chronicle that survives um, from 754, so after the effect, says that uh, Yudo allied with a different Muslim, a guy named uh, Munuza, Mun uh, uh, and was opposed by another Arab army who Charles Martel then fought, that second Arab army, at Tours after Eudo fled in defeat. Um, there is no mention of an, any invasion in our, any Arabic sources except for a one-sentence note about a failed raid um, over the Pyrenees in one source. 
it's more prominent in European chronicles that occur after the Crusade, after the First Crusade, which is in approximately 11, uh, 1100. So, you know, 400 years after the event, but is more or less otherwise forgotten. Right, so all these sources point to a very minor battle um, between Charles Martel and some kind of combination of Saracen and other Frank, kind of rebellious Frankish forces, um, which didn't really make a big impact one way or the other. Right, um, and there's no reason kind of to promote it, no reason to people for people after the fact to care about it because Charles Martel for the French, um, for a lot of the time, was kind of a German, kind of a, a Germanic tyrant. Right. Um, but as we kind of talked about already, France built its national identity, right, uh, by opposing Muslim or Arab corsairs in the Mediterranean. And so in the 19th century, this battle, this kind of battle between the one of the only battles between Franks and Muslims that occurred in Europe and not in the Middle East, um, started to gain a incredible amount of prominence and started to be written as this world historical event. Um, the, as one histor modern historian has said, the, the vagaries of the sources helped out enormously because people didn't have to kind of adhere to any real story because they wouldn't be proved wrong because the sources don't say, right? And so you have some things like in this painting from uh, 1874 to commemorate, uh, which is in the kind of town hall at Poitiers, uh, commemorating Charles Martel as defending Christianity from the Saracens. You can see Charles Martel in there with his hatchet on his horse in very anachronistic clothing with the, the flag, with the oriflame, the flag with the cross of Christ um, behind him and the defeated um, Muslims with a woman for some reason um, crouching in the foreground, uh, dark skin, light skin, Christian, pagan north-south orientalism on proud display here and so 19th century historians shift this complicated picture of kind of battle skirmishes and shifting alliances into the straightforward language of indo-europeans versus semitic which are language groups not cultures remember uh christian versus muslim etc um, Germans, kind of those, those Germans seeking unification, kind of latch on to Charles Martel as well as the first kind of great German defender of Christianity. Um, as a convenient, this was a convenient way, kind of because it was so old, to unify German, Catholic, and Protestant groups against a common uh, Muslim foe. And eventually, this becomes cast as a battle of nation states, a battle of the Islamic nation versus the French nation. Um, and I want to emphasize the number of kind of paintings that are going on here, the number, amount of art that's going on in the background here, because despite its pretense, um, we can see kind of in these paintings and in these academic discourses that academic and popular history were and really are not separate, right? And these kind of academic musings and academic developments along the national lines, very kind of high level stuff that I've been talking about, are also mirrors popular obsession with the Middle Ages kind of in the quote romantic period, big R romantic period. And so you see kind of Walter Scott as a bestseller in this period. Um, his kind of depiction of Richard, who's um, kind of the, the guy in the lower right there, um, that's again a, a pretty contemporary with Walter Scott painting of Richard, um, as a kind of this big brawly guy who's kind of a crap king, is the predominant academic opinion of Richard um, for most of uh, the past 200 years. The tournament that you will read about in Ivanhoe was recreated to its finest detail in 1831 in England. Um, court scenes and dioramas at, exp at kind of expositions were incredibly well attended. Um, and the paintings of, uh, there's a group of painters which are called the Pre-Raphaelites, were obsessed with these sorts of medieval imagery. This is the La Belle Dame Sans Merci, um, the, the beautiful woman without mercy. Um, it's a constant theme, and you can see this kind of, this armor that no one would have worn, um, and this horse that no one could have ridden, and this dress that no one would have ever had, and this very white kind of skin and pallor. Um, in this bucolic and picturesque background as this very, it's an image of the Middle Ages which never could have happened. 
Um, no one would have worn this armor into any sort of battle. It would be much too expensive. This would be sure to show. Again, remember that kind of the idea that only the stuff that survives is what people kind of had as models. Um, and so the battle armor didn't survive, but the show armor did. Um, we also see it in what has been called Gothic Revival, which is a form of architecture. And I have the Houses of Parliament here, which are a 19th century building built in a Gothic style. Um, the view of Gothic as kind of a sign of Western progress, of Western architectural skill. Um, at the same time as these kind of buildings are going up, Victor Hugo is writing Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is actually a book about the durability and utility of architecture, right? Um, and about the kind of the ways in which the cathedral as a, as a sign of monument of culture was replaced by literature as a sign and a monument of culture. Um, there's, a, there's a scene in, in Hunchback where, where there's a book in hand and one of the characters says, this will kill that. That is to say, the book will kill the cathedral. Um, and then you have people kind of romantics expressing similar opinions kind of, but in a uh, wanting to get back to a medieval ideal. Um, one German said that, um, one German scholar said that or just a kind of a German intellectual said that um, medievals, you know, moderns today just have mere opinions, and it takes more than mere opinion to erect a Gothic cathedral, right? The Middle Age, the medievals had beliefs, they had this romantic belief behind them. They had this this this, this sense of being, right? Um, and so the later kind of nineteenth century is a wash is is deeply embedded in language of chivalry of emphasis on horsemanship of knightly self-sacrifice and when we think we're thinking about the middle ages as we will kind of find out particularly when we talk about things like game of thrones it's mostly we're actually mostly remembering a popular image the popular image or memory of the middle ages that was forged in the 19th century and this kind of imbuing of medieval of the medieval past into every aspect of one's life in England and France and Germany in the 19th century was key to Amer both American and European identities right up through the First World War. But as we will find out next week, the Middle Ages would not survive trench warfare. Okay, that is all for this week. Uh, some just reminders here that office hours are will be from Wednesday from 12 to 2. There's a Zoom link on Canvas. Um, there was a pretty long line last time, so if you have to wait a little while to get in, um, I am there. It's, it's just there's a couple people ahead of you. Um, sections start this week in person section will be in Friedman 108 from 1 to 2 p.m. That is our regular class meeting time on Friday. Um, we're going to work out the numbers exactly. Um, if you are remote or you do not wish to come to an in-person meeting, which is more than fair, um, there will be a Zoom meeting that's going to be either the hour before or the hour after. I will send out a poll um, for those of you who are interested to fill out and we will see. Um, and again, if you have any questions about this lecture, about previous lectures, about things we've discussed, if you want me to kind of go into more detail on anything, send me an email, elgregoli at brown.edu, and I will uh, get back to you and make a uh, response video by Thursday evening. Other than that, uh, have a great week.